No? How about now? Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay, good. Well, thanks for coming out today. I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. Chris Neal, who's coming to us today from University of Oregon. Um, I don't like to give really long introductions because it's just taking time away from the speaker, but just want to briefly mention that um, some of Chris's early work has made a, a really huge impact on the field, especially the discovery of uh, various effects of locomotion on responses and what we thought of as purely sensory areas. And I think that that has really taken off in the field and really inspired the way that a lot of people um, do their science, uh, including me. And in Chris's own lab, he's really continued to follow that trend, um, uh, or not to follow that trend, but really push that forward in some really mechanistic and computational ways that I've been uh, really excited to read about. I know he's doing a lot of other cool stuff, which I don't know if we'll hear about today or not, but some serotonergic stuff um, and uh, some stuff with a variety of, of interesting model organisms. Um, I want to mention, too, that Chris has been um, acknowledged with a Faculty Excellence Award from the University of Oregon recently, and is also, as I saw in your CV, the, the founding co-chair of the um, DEI committee at uh, the university or at the Institute of Neuroscience. Um, so with that, I think I will uh, let Chris take it away. Just one last comment. Um, if you have uh, clarification questions that are really important to address for you to understand the um, the talk, please please go ahead and ask during the talk. But let's try to save more of the in depth discussion for afterwards. Hey, well, can you guys all hear me? Okay, all right. Uh, thanks for that uh, very uh, kind introduction, Chris, and uh, thanks for the invitation to visit. It's great to be here. I was originally scheduled to come back in, I think, October or so, but unfortunately, that was right when COVID hit my family, so I didn't make it then. I'm glad I'm able to be here uh, in person rather than uh, virtually. And uh, I've had the opportunity to tell you about some of the work we've been doing uh, studying neural circuits for vision, particularly in the context of the natural world. So when you think about studying vision, you often picture something like an eye exam. So a head fixed subject staring at two dimensional stimuli on a screen, trying to make some kind of arbitrary uh, discrimination, E versus F. We actually use our vision for much more interesting things out in the real world. So for example, we use our vision to track fast moving objects, drive an appropriate motor output. Uh, we use our vision to navigate through the world. I really like this video from Mary Hayhoe's lab that shows how complex just the, the uh, task of walking down a path is. So you have to identify the path that just differs from the background based on kind of minor uh, textural cues. But this whole thing is also complicated by the fact that there's continuous ongoing head and eye movements that cause the scene to be shifting and much more dynamic than this simple two-dimensional stimulus over here. Uh, we also use our visual system to detect uh, hidden objects. So for example, this camouflaged octopus here and of course, the octopus itself has to use its vision to be able to analyze the scene and choose the appropriate camouflage pattern on its skin. So despite the richness of how we actually use our visual system out in the world, uh, we tend to study in the lab under conditions very much like an eye exam, a head fixed subject looking at two-dimensional geometric stimuli on the screen. And so what I want to tell you about today is our efforts over the past five or six years to move away from these types of paradigms towards paradigms that are, are closer to the way we actually use vision out in the world. So a quick overview of what I'll talk about today. Uh, the majority of the talk will be about natural vision in the mouse, uh, focusing on prey capture, a paradigm that we developed to be able to look at visual function and the underlying uh, circuits. I'll tell you about some newer work, uh, developing methods to study neural coding during free movement. And then towards the end, I'll tell you about a new direction in the lab studying visual processing uh, in the octopus. Okay, so before I dive into the natural behavior of the mouse, I thought I would you know, tell you a few of the things that motivated us to switch towards natural behavior. And these actually go back to some of the things I found when I was a postdoc in Mike Stryker's lab uh, that Chris alluded to in the introduction. So at the time, this is about 15 years ago, we wanted to start using the mouse as a model system to be able to use all the genetic tools that were coming out of the time, you know, optogenetics and so on, <laughs> to be able to address some of the longstanding questions about vision, going back to Hubel and Weasel, how do you get orientation selectivity and so on. But a big question at the time was, you know, can you actually study vision in the mouse? You know, aren't mice blind? And not such a bad question. Uh, they actually do have very low acuity vision. Uh, so a scene like this uh, ends up looking like this to the mouse. Uh, that's largely because they have small eyes, so fewer photoreceptors, basically fewer megapixels in their detector. But the question was, you know, given that they have this low resolution input coming in, are other aspects of visual processing conserved? Is their cortex performing the same types of computations, just using lower resolution information coming in? 
Uh, so to test this, I did a series of recordings using different types of visual stimuli. Uh, we found things like orientation selectivity, contrast invariant tuning, uh, that were similar to what people had seen in other species like cat and monkey. Uh, the one that I want to focus on today is the spatial structure of receptive fields. What's the pattern of light and dark out in the visual scene that causes a neuron to fire? And of course, Hubel and Weasel had shown that in V1, that tends to be either bars or edges at a particular orientation. So we wanted to see if this was also true in the mouse. Uh, to do this, we use a technique called the spike triggered average uh, to calculate receptive fields. Uh, the way this works is we play this uh, Gaussian noise stimulus, basically random uh, white and dark blobs. Uh, we're recording in visual cortex. I was using uh, silicon probes. Um, and uh, we take the, the units recorded from the silicon probe, uh, focus in on one unit. Each time that unit fires a spike, we take the image that was on the, scene, on the screen immediately preceding that spike, collect these all together, average them to get what's known as a spike triggered average. And this is what we get. So in this case here, uh, this, so you can think of this as, you know, what was the average stimulus that preceded a spike firing? Uh, given certain constraints on the stimulus set, you can think of this as the linear kernel of the cell's response. In this case here, it's a light, uh, a light bar uh, with dark edges, very much like you might've seen from Hubel and Weasel's old recordings on the, on the screen. Uh, so this was uh, reassuring that we could get receptive fields out that looked like what we might expect. Uh, we did this for uh, uh, large uh, populations of neuron, a large population of neurons. Uh, several examples are shown here. Uh, so now this is color coded. So blue is when the uh, region where the neurons are responding to dark, red is responding to light. And you can see that this neuron here responded to an elongated dark spot. This is an edge between dark and light. And this is a dark bar on light edges. Uh, we compared this to some data uh, that Dario Ringot had recorded using similar method, uh, similar method uh, in monkey V1. And you can see that the recept types of receptive fields that he got were quite similar. Uh, one thing I should note here is that the scale bar for mouse is 20 degrees, so relatively large compared to the one degree uh, uh, scale bar for the monkey. But to compare these, you know, you, if you look at these, you might think, okay, I just you know, cherry pick the right examples. I put them in the MATLAB color scheme. Everything looks kind of the same. Uh, we actually did some calculations for the aficionados. We fit these to Gabor functions, calculated a couple scale-free parameters to show that the neurons in mouse V1 and monkey V1 really were responding to similar structure in the visual scene, but just at different length scales. So this is kind of cool. It tells us something about you know, how, what the visual system is trying to extract, that even if you're working at different length scales, you want to extract the same structure, so you know, the scale-free property of natural scenes. Also very encouraging for the use of mouse to study vision, because if their receptive fields look similar, then potentially they're using the same types of cortical circuits to compute those. But one thing that was kind of left lingering for me was you know, this scale bar here, the fact that these receptive fields are so much larger. And in particular, if I plot these on the same length scale, you can really see how different uh, the mouse and primate visual system is. And this raised the question you know, that kind of stuck with me, you know, what do you actually do with these really large visual receptive fields? Obviously with a very you know, small receptive field like primates, you can analyze fine detail, high acuity. Uh, what do you do with a big receptive field like this? Uh, in particular, you know, what types of visual behaviors can this support? Another question that came up back uh, when I was a postdoc in the Stryker Lab came from when we started doing record recordings in awake animals. So this was right around the time that David Tank had developed uh, the spherical treadmill technique that is probably familiar to many of you. Uh, we have a head fixed mouse that's on a styrofoam ball, so he's free to run. Uh, we have an electrode going down into cortex. Uh, there'd be a computer monitor over here where we're presenting visual stimuli. And you can see that the animal you know, spontaneously alternates between periods of sitting still and running. And we found pretty quickly that there was a big difference in the neural activity uh, between those two states. Uh, so an example is shown here. This is spikes uh, from one individual neuron to repeated presentations of a grading stimulus. It's the exact same stimulus on every trial here. And you can see that this neuron fired spikes on each trial. But if I color code them as to whether the animal was stationary in red or moving in blue, this neuron fired about twice as many spikes when the animal is moving versus when it was sitting still. And this was true for the majority of neurons that we recorded in layer two, three of cortex. Uh, there was relatively little change in spontaneous rate, but roughly a doubling of the firing rate in response to a visual stimulus with relatively little change in the orientation selectivity. So it was like the uh, V1 was basically turning up the gain on the visual responses, turning up the volume when the mouse starts moving. And you can imagine, you know, we can make up some kind of just so stories about why this might be that, you know, when you're sitting still, the mouse is using other sensory modalities. When you start running, uh, you have to use your vision uh, to know where you're going. But we didn't really quite know, you know, it's still hard to kind of show what, what's the computational role 
of you know, this change in gain uh, if we don't know what the animal was trying to do. And I should add, you know, since this time, a number of other groups have shown many different aspects of uh, sensory processing that change with locomotion and arousal. Uh, my lab and others have uh, figured out some of the circuits that are mediating this, particular connections uh, through the brain stem, basal forebrain up to cortex. We're kind of left with this lingering question of why? What's the computational role of turning up the gain? So those are two, the two big questions that drove us to start thinking about natural vision and vision in the real world. One is how does this type of visual information get used for real world, beha real world behaviors? So for example, how could you use these receptive fields to do something like tracking a moving object? And then what's the role of these movement signals in visual processing during real movement, as opposed to a mouse running on a ball? How might this uh, change in gain play a role in your ability to walk down a path, for instance? So this, these kind of types of questions let us, uh, or, or, um, these types of questions are, are difficult to address in this type of head fix situation that I described at the beginning, you know, a head fix subject looking at a screen. And there's several reasons why this you know, setup is limiting for this, uh, this setup is limiting for these types of questions. Uh, one of which is the disruption of the impact of movement. This is kind of obvious. If you're holding onto a mouse's head, you're not allowing it to move, you've changed its movement pattern. This has several consequences. One of which is as we move through the world, the visual scene changes in predictable ways. And you've eliminated this by holding the mouse's head still. Furthermore, you don't know what the mouse is trying to do. We just have this mouse on a ball with his head held still. Sometimes he runs, sometimes he sits still. What's he trying to achieve those times when he's running? Is he running towards something? Is it fear response? And without knowing the goal, because we've stopped the movement, it's hard to say, you know, what you know, therefore, what's the effect of this change in gain? Another limitation of this type of setup is the non-natural stimuli that we use. Um, as visual physiologists, we tend to like things like Gabor patches and gratings. But even if you show like a picture of a natural scene, that's still very different from the rich stimulus you get as you move through a three-dimensional environment. And then finally, the types of behaviors that we tend to do in this setup are also very non-natural. So for example, having a mouse you know, run to the right or run to the left, lick right, lick left, in response to a stimulus that's on the screen. And any of you who have trained mice in uh, these types of tasks, I was talking to Joseph about this this morning. If you've tried to train a mouse on a task like this, you realize it's actually quite hard for them to learn it. You know, they'll sit there for two or three weeks. All they have to do is realize, oh, the grading was on the right. I just need to run to the right and I'll get this water reward. But they don't seem to make that connection. So while those types of tasks, you know, are great for studying how you form new associations, it probably doesn't represent how the mouse is actually using its vision as it's normally moving through the world. They aren't usually trying to lick right or lick left in response to gradings in the world. They're probably trying to move towards a uh, uh, relevant stimulus. So you might think, well, okay, well, if we're just using the wrong stimuli and the wrong behavior, then maybe we don't get as many spikes in our recordings and we have to take a long time to train them. But I would actually suggest that this maybe, you know, because this doesn't represent what the mouse's brain evolved to do, maybe we're actually missing a lot of what visual cortex is for because we've never studied that entire regime where it's actually being used. So based on these limitations, we started to think about, you know, what type of natural visual behavior could we study in the mouse? Um, and there's several that have been looked at before, uh, one of which is fear responses. So if a dark spot moves or looms overhead, a mouse will freeze or flee in response to that. And a number of people, uh, particularly uh, Tiago Branco's lab, have looked at the circuit mecha mechanisms that mediate that. Uh, mice also use their vision for navigation. So out in the world, a uh, mouse would need to use vision to be able to find his way home. Uh, I also like to point out that you know, one of the standard laboratory tasks that people use, you think of it as a learning memory task, is the Morris water maze. But in fact, that's also a visual task because the mice have to use the distal cues around the arena to remember where that platform was. But my postdoc, postdoc Jen uh, got interested in whether our mice would perform prey capture. And she was inspired by this species. Uh, this is the grasshopper mouse. It's actually very distantly related to our laboratory mice. Uh, and it's often described as being specialized for a carnivorous lifestyle. They have really big claws, they have big teeth, they can catch insects, scorpions, frogs. Um, they're, you know, they're kind of natural born killers. Um, and so Jen wondered, you know, if our lab mice would also perform uh, prey capture. And I was like, no way, they're inbred, they've never seen an insect in their life. She did the simplest test of just dropping a cricket in the cage. Sure enough, the mouse chases it, catches it and eats it. And so she was off and running. Uh, so she uh, went on to standardize the prey capture paradigm. As she mentioned, there's a couple of steps that she did to kind of optimize this. Uh, one of which is to get the mouse, you basically have to habituate the mouse to the whole experimental setup. 
So if you just take a you know, lab mouse, put it in a brightly lit arena with an experimenter standing over it, uh, the mouse will basically just kind of run and hide in the corner. Or sometimes it'll start to chase the cricket, and the cricket makes a movement and it runs away in the opposite direction, has a strong anxiety response. So she habituates them first to uh, chasing crickets and then to being in this brightly lit arena. Uh, she also food deprives them for about eight hours. Uh, they will hunt crickets even if they aren't hungry, but they kind of do it in a much more lackadaisical manner. So if you really want them to hunt on demand, you just make sure that they're hungry. Uh, but once you do this, uh, you get behavior like we see here. So we've got the mouse and the cricket. And you can see that each time the, mouse, the cricket escapes, uh, the mouse makes a beeline approach towards the cricket's location, so straight across the arena there. Uh, you'll see that the mouse isn't quite as good at catching the cricket when it gets there. And that's probably where some of these you know, specializations for a carnivorous lifestyle come into play. The mice, you know, our lab mice don't have those big claws to be able to catch it. Uh, for us, that actually ends up being convenient because it turns out it's these long distance approaches that use vision. So each time the cricket escapes, it's kind of like starting over a new trial. So we can get you know, eight or 10 trials out of one individual cricket. If the mouse just went straight to it, caught it you know, two seconds and uh, wouldn't get much data out of that. So this shows that, you know, sure enough, our lab mice, uh, even though they're inbred and have never seen a cricket, can chase and hunt, uh, hunt and capture crickets. Uh, but are they actually using vision to be able to do this? Uh, Jen did a couple of uh, different sensory manipulations to test this. Uh, she started off by deafening the animals uh, by putting in earplugs. Um, and as you'll see here, there's a couple of controls for the deafening that I'm happy to talk about. You can see that the mouse is still able to make those beeline approaches direct to the cricket's location. So they don't need hearing to be able to locate the cricket and get to it. On the other hand, when she put them in the dark or actually under IR illumination so we can still video them, you can see that the mouse doesn't quite realize that the cricket's there, just wanders right past its location. Um, I should note that the cricket doesn't actually make that many uh, auditory cues. Oh, sorry, fast forward through a minute or so of them wandering around the arena together. Once the mouse bumps into the cricket, it's still able to chase it and pursue it. So it's not like that they don't hunt in the dark. They just don't know where the cricket is until they either bump into it or until the cricket makes some kind of large sound. And in fact, crickets, this is something I learned when we started doing this, turns out crickets actually suppress their chirping in the presence of a predator. So they're pretty much silent until the cricket bumps, uh, until the mouse bumps into them. So this shows that they need vision to be able to do those long distance approaches. So Jen went on to quantify how they did this uh, using a couple of different metrics. Uh, this figure here is one that I really like because it addresses a lot of those questions that we had about uh, mouse vision based on those really large receptive fields that I described uh, earlier on. So first of all, uh, as I, this uh, graph here is showing how accurately the mouse is aimed towards the cricket's location, so the azimuth of mouse relative to the cricket, as a function of how far away the mouse is uh, from the cricket. These two lines here are when the animal is in the dark. So you can see when the mouse is in the dark, either with hearing or without, it essentially never aims towards the cricket's location above chance. On the other hand, uh, when the animal is in the light, and even if its ears are plugged, starting at about 15 centimeters away, it starts to aim towards the cricket. So this tells us something about the distance uh, that the vi mouse visual system works over. So those really big receptive fields, you know, back in the striker lab, we hypothesized, you know, maybe they're really good for seeing like big things at a distance, like landmarks or close things, uh, small things that are close up that you might be about to grab. But this showed us that the mouse visual system can also operate over this intermediate range of five to 15 centimeters. Likewise, at 15 centimeters away, when they start to make their approaches, uh, cricket is one centimeter across. So that means it spans about five degrees of visual angle. So about the size of your hand at arm's length. So this tells us something about the size of stimuli that the mouse visual system can detect. Five degrees is about roughly the size of a retinal ganglion cell receptor field. So this suggests that they're able to take that information that's available at the retina and convert that into detecting and localizing the cricket. And then finally, when the animal is close up and actively pursuing, they're able to aim to within about plus or minus 10 degrees. So this tells us something about the accuracy of their visual system. They're able to take that information you know, out in the retina of five degrees and convert that into an accurate orienting of plus or minus 10 degrees, even as the cricket's uh, trying to evade them. So as I mentioned, I really like this because it tells us, you know, answers some of these questions about uh, what, the mi what mice can see, what can they do with these receptive fields. Um, you can kind of think of it as a way to give the mouse a vision test, but now instead of by training them to do something in the context of a natural behavior. But I think even better, it doesn't just say what can they see, but it says what information are they actually using to be able to drive their behavior. 
So we've gone on to use uh, PrayCapture in a couple of different ways uh, since then, uh, one of which was uh, another project uh, done by Jen. I should mention that Jen has now gone on to her own lab at University of Nevada, Reno. Uh, so if you're interested in these types of experiments, you should definitely uh, get in touch with her. Uh, one of the things that she did before she left the lab was to study the role of different superior colliculus cell types uh, in prey capture. Uh, I'll just summarize this briefly. The, the main thing she wanted to look at were there were two cell types, these wide field vertical neurons and narrow field vertical neurons. They've been known for about 100 years, going back to Cajal, who first described their anatomy. Lots of people had recorded from them, so we knew what their receptive fields looked like. But we didn't know when they get engaged for different types of behavior. And Jen showed that these wide field vertical neurons that have really big receptive fields were involved in detecting the crickets, uh, detecting that the cricket was out there and initiating the pursuit. So big receptive fields are good for saying that something's there, but not necessarily where it is. And that was consistent with what we saw in the behavior. On the other hand, these narrow field vertical neurons that had very small dendritic arbors and small receptive fields uh, uh, ended up being involved in the orienting and approach towards the cricket's location. So again, that kind of makes sense. If you have a small receptive field, you have very good localization, and then you can use that to drive the approach. So first, this was rewarding because now we we're able to take these two cell types that have been known for a long time. We knew a lot about them, but Jen was able to link them up with specific roles uh, as an animal is moving through the world and trying to um, uh, pursue a moving object. Another thing that we used PrayCapture for uh, was to look at the patterns of eye movements that a mouse makes. So a mouse doesn't have a fovea. You know, like us, we tend to saccade around scenes to get uh, our, our fovea on the area of interest. Uh, mice don't have a fovea, so there's a big question about how do they actually move their eyes? And the challenge in addressing this previously was, well, we don't necessarily know what they're trying to look at at any given time. But now in prey capture, we have a target. We know what they should be interested in. We can look at how they move their eyes relative to that. So a grad student in the lab, Angie McKell, uh, set up uh, miniature eye tracking cameras uh, mounted to the mouse's head. Uh, oops. This is her uh, wearing the human equivalent of the head mounted cameras. Um, and what she did is she recorded the eye position as the mouse was chasing the cricket. And she showed that what they did, they, when they're sitting still, they don't actually saccade around to look for the uh, cricket's location. They follow the cricket with their head. But as they're moving their head, their eyes move to compensate for their he those head movements. So if the head moves one direction, the eyes move the opposite direction. Uh, compensatory movements, probably driven by the VOR, that stabilize the image. And then once the eyes have moved far enough, they'll jump and catch up with the head. So it ends up creating what uh, Michael Land called a saccade and fixate pattern, kind of similar to the way that we saccade around a scene. But in this case, it's driven by head movements instead of by the eye movements. You have a series of stabilizations and then a saccade to jump up with where uh, to jump and catch up with where the head is. Um, yeah. So, uh, So these types of uh, experiments for me, you know, I came into studying prey capture, actually, you know, came from a physics background. So the idea of like having a two alternative force choice task is very appealing. You have one bit of information, you can calculate a psychometric curve. Now, all of a sudden we have mice chasing crickets around an arena. How are you gonna, ever going to analyze this and get something useful out of it? Uh, to me, it was really rewarding that we could do things like we could calculate the psychometric curve that I showed you in the previous slide. We could figure out what different cell types are doing. We could start to look at active vision. And so this has led us to develop several other uh, visual behaviors in the lab, uh, one of which I want to describe that was developed by a postdoc, uh, Phil Parker. Uh, Phil was interested in studying depth perception, uh, but not depth perception the way we often think about it in terms of stereo vision, the disparity between the two eyes, but depth perception based on motion parallax. As you probably know, motion parallax is a phenomenon. If you move your head side to side, things that are far away will only move a little bit on the retina, and things that are close up will move a lot more. It's actually a very strong cue for depth, even in us humans with binocular vision. If you cover one eye, everything kind of goes flat and you move side to side, things start to pop out. And Phil was particularly interested in this because it's a visual uh, computation that combines the visual input and movement, but in a way where we know what the computation is. You take the ratio of how much you moved or how much the world moved, and that tells you something about the distance of an object. So now we know what the computation is the visual system is trying to perform and that might uh, help us make sense of some of these movement signals. Uh, so to study this in the mouse, uh, Phil set up a task uh, to have, I should say, uh, this task was inspired by some old work by Mel Goodale, uh, who had shown that uh, Mongolian gerbils can jump across gaps of different distances and suggested that they're using motion parallax to do this. So Phil set out to see if our lab mice would also jump across gaps and potentially use uh, motion parallax. Uh, sure enough, uh, with a little bit of uh, reward, in the form of a tortilla chip over here. Uh, the mice can jump across gaps of actually quite impressive uh, distances. 
Uh, they don't really need to learn how to jump. You know, probably anybody who's chased a mouse around the lab, uh, <laughs> a mouse that's escaped from the cage knows that they're pretty good at jumping across things. Uh, they, we think that, you know, they really just need to know that it's worth their while uh, to jump across this gap, that they'll get a food reward. But what you might have noticed is that right before the mouse jumps, it bobs its head up and down. And that was uh, the movement that Mel Goodell had suggested. It was generating the motion parallax uh, to be able to estimate depth. Uh, so Phil went on to quantify this using deep lab cut to track uh, the trajectories. Uh, you can see that the mouse is generally quite successful. Uh, occasionally, they will either under jump or over jump. But we can plot, for instance, the distance across the gap versus the distance that the animal jumped. And you can see that these track each other quite well. So again, this is another way of measuring a psychometric curve, but now where the animal's, actually, the animal's decision is actually coupled to its natural behavioral output. So instead of you know, estimating depth and then licking left or right, they're using that depth estimate for what they actually would use it for in the world, creating a motor output to jump the appropriate distance. Uh, he was also, uh, 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 wondering whether they would, might be, you know, as a test as to whether they might be using motion parallax, motion parallax is a cue that you can get from just one eye, you don't need both eyes. So he sutured one eyelid closed and showed that the animal was just as good at jumping across uh, the gap as when it had both eyes uh, available. He also did some other analysis I won't go into today, looking at the particular types of movements that they make, showing that these kind of sampling movements were more frequent uh, when they had one eye closed, uh, uh, consistent with motion parallax. And in fact, now uh, Phil has started his own lab at Rutgers, and he's uh, starting to look at what the uh, circuit mechanisms that are that might be mediating this. So how does the motor signal get combined with the visual input? And so again, if that's of interest to you, definitely uh, get in touch with Phil. So this has kind of been our approach to natural behaviors now, is to take a computation that we think the visual system might be performing and find a way to cast it into the context of how the mouse would actually use that when it's going through its uh, normal behaviors. So coupling those visual, you know, the visual computation to a natural uh, motor behavioral output. But uh, you might have noticed that there was a little bit of a confound here. If we wanna go in and start studying the neural circuits, how are we gonna actually measure the neural, decode, the neural coding while the animal is moving through uh, the world? Uh, and particularly the fact that the animal is freely moving raises a huge challenge for studying vision. So the basic thing that we do as a visual neurophysiologist is there's a stimulus out there in the world, you take the neural activity and you try and relate those two to each other. But of course, when the animal is running around its environment, you're no longer presenting those stimuli, the mouse is choosing where it wants to look. And it's not just moving its head, but it's also moving its eyes relative to that scene. So how can we figure out what the mouse is actually seeing and relate that to the neural activity? Uh, Phil set up a system to do this. Uh, this was his uh, big pandemic project. Uh, he solved this problem using a, a set of head-mounted cameras, uh, similar to the ones that we were using for eye tracking. But now we have one camera that's aimed out of the world, kind of like a GoPro, so we can see this, uh, the scene that's in front of the mouse uh, from the mouse's perspective. He had, has another camera uh, that's aimed back at the eye, so we can see where the eye is pointed uh, within that scene. Uh, we have a silicon probe. Uh, we use these four shank uh, probes from diagnostic biochips. Let us record on the order of 100 neurons at a time in a chronic implant. And then we can put all this together to record neural activity while an animal is moving through an arena. We can estimate the visual scene and get the neural activity. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, when we put it all together. So over here is the scene from the mouse's point of view. Uh, here's the mouse's eye. This is a trace of the uh, horizontal eye position. Uh, this is a trace of the mouse's head tilt. And this is the neural activity down here. So you can probably already see that there's a pretty big shift in the pattern of neural activity between the when the animal is sitting still here uh, and when it's moving here. So this is very encouraging. In fact, often, you know, this was almost kind of like my dream data. Going back to the striker lab, we found this effective movement on vision. I was like, what's actually happening if we let the mouse move through the world? And so now we have this data. We know what the mouse is seeing. We know where its eye is pointed. We have all the neural activity. But how do we put all of this together? And there's two big challenges associated with that, uh, one of which is taking these two images together and figuring what, out what the image is that's landing on the retina. How can we uh, calibrate for the given eye movement what stimulus is actually landing in the, on the eye? How do we have to transform this image to represent the retinal image? And second, uh, natural scenes like this uh, pose real problems for estimating receptive fields. 
Uh, they violate basically all of the assumptions that go into something like a spike triggered average. There's very high spatial and temporal correlations. So we didn't need another uh, nonlinear approach to be able to, or we need an approach that uh, takes into account uh, those correlations in order to estimate a receptive field. Uh, so very brave uh, grad student in the lab, Elliot Abe, uh, took on this data analysis challenge. Uh, and he solved these two problems kind of in one fell swoop. The problem of calibrating the eye tracking to figure out what the actual image is landing on the eye, and then estimating the receptive fields. I should mention that a lot of this approach was inspired by some work from Jake Yates and Jude Mitchell, who were doing similar things uh, to measure foveal receptive fields in free gazing marmosets. So we start off by first uh, calibrating the eye tracking. And the way he does this is, is he has a shallow uh, neural network that takes in the eye position as you mentioned, we also measure the head tilt, and that's because the mouse's eyes can actually rotate in the sockets. This is called cyclotorsion. We have a very limited amount of cyclotorsion if you tilt your head side to side. But if a mouse with its eyes on the side of its head, basically if they tilt their head down 20 degrees, their eyes rotate by 20 degrees. And so we're using the head tilt as a proxy for that cyclotorsion because it's hard to measure. So we send in those eye movement parameters into a shifter network, and this network learns how to shift that world cam image going in in order to be able to approximate the retinal input. This uh, corrected image then goes into another uh, two layer network. This is just a simple, uh, basically, a, yeah, kind of essentially a, a perceptron network. But Elliot's uh, realization is that a two layer network can instantiate a generalized linear model. And generalized linear model can account for a lot of those correlations uh, in the, the visual input coming in. And by casting this into a neural network, he can now train this whole thing end to end in order to predict uh, the neural activity. So essentially this neural network learns how to calibrate the eye camera and what types of receptive field or, and the receptive field of each neuron that enables it to predict the neural activity. And importantly, the weights of this uh, GLM end up being, you know, just like the spike triggered average, they end up being uh, the, uh, a map of the receptive field. And so when we do this, sure enough, we get out receptive fields that look much like what you know, Hubel and Weasel described years ago and what we uh, found from our head fixed recordings, for example, an elongated dark spot, an edge between light and dark, uh, Gabor-like receptive fields, and so on. So we can get receptive fields out. Uh, we can also use uh, 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 this network to be able to predict uh, the, neural, the pattern of neural activity. And as you can see here, it actually does a pretty good job of being able to predict uh, the pattern of, of activity, even as an animal is freely moving through its environment. I should mention, you know, we calculate uh, these firing rates uh, with a, a time bin of about half a second or a second. And that's largely just because, you know, the visual stimulus is highly correlated over that time period anyways, due to the speed of the mouse's uh, head movements. But you can see that for some of the best neurons, we can get up to a correlation coefficient of about 0.6 between the actual firing rate and our prediction. Uh, with a median of about 0.3 across the population. So I mentioned, you know, these look like what we might record uh, in a head fixed animal, um, but to actually test that, uh, Phil and Elliot went on to do a direct comparison. So they recorded from an animal, a head fixed animal, looking at that same Gaussian noise stimulus that I showed you earlier, calculated receptive fields from that, and then uh, while recording the same units, let the animal free, let it run around in the arena, and calculate the receptive fields during free movement. And the results uh, line up uh, quite well. I should mention that there's a large fraction of units that uh, only have a receptive field in one condition or the other. About a third of the units had receptive fields in both conditions. And for those, uh, they ended up matching up quite nicely. The receptive fields are in the same location, same orientation, polarity, and so on. And we get a mean correl correlation coefficient of about 0.3 uh, for the ones that have receptive fields that are matching the two, or the, uh, the, that have receptive fields in both conditions mean correlation coefficient of about 0.3, even at the level of a pixel-wise comparison. Uh, so this was reassuring, first of all, that we weren't actually just pulling noise or you know, some kind of artifact out of our free-moving recordings that these two things match up. Uh, it was also kind of nice to show that you know, 50 years of visual physiology under head fixation weren't completely wrong. Um, but it still leaves open this big question of what are all those other neurons doing, the ones that are only respond during free movement? Are they responding to some aspect of the visual scene that's not present in uh, you know, two-dimensional stimuli, uh, things like the shape of objects, depth, and so on? But also, I think even more exciting for us is that now we can start to do visual physiology while an animal is engaged in these natural behaviors. 
I mentioned before during prey capture, we were able to shut down neurons and show what their effect was. Then we could correlate that to what people had known from head fix recordings. But what we'd really like to be able to do is go, on, go in while an animal is chasing a cricket and say those neurons that we think are involved in detection, do they actually fire during those moments of detection? And now we can do that. Another thing that we've done with this system is to go back and look at the signals around uh, the, the, the neural uh, signals that occur around head movements. And in particular, this was uh, inspired by uh, several groups recently who had shown very strong encoding of head movements in freely moving mice. Uh, the Scanziani lab and the Cox lab, both show that when an animal moves its head, you get a movement signal. But as I mentioned from the prey capture study, we know that when the mouse moves its head, there can be two different types of corresponding eye movements. There can be either a compensatory movement in which case the visual scene is not going to change, or there can be a saccade when you jump to a new location. And so we wanted to see whether these two different types of head movements, either one that's compensated by eye movements or one that includes a saccade, might have different signals. Uh, so uh, a really great team, Phil Parker, we're working with uh, two undergrads, uh, again, kind of a big pandemic effort, uh, went in and did this, measuring the, the signals around head and eye movements in a freely moving mouse. Uh, example is, for one unit is shown here. So this is spike rasters for every time the head moved and there was a gaze shift. And this is every time there was a head movement and the eyes compensated for it. And you can see that there's a very strong signal when the animal shifts its gaze, but not if the eyes are compensating. Uh, this neuron had a very strong positive response to the gaze shift. Uh, we saw other types of responses. Some had this biphasic response to a gaze shift. Uh, some had a negative response to the gaze shift. But across the population, we really only saw, or in the majority, or the vast majority of neurons, uh, we saw a response only to the gaze shifts and not to the compensatory movements. So this shows, you know, if you're just looking at head movements, you think, okay, the neurons are responding all the time. But if you then go and separate it out by what the eyes are doing, you can see that not all head movements are equal. It's the head movements that lead to a new visual input that are driving that neural activity. So as I mentioned, we saw in kind of a diverse set of uh, uh, kind of wave of uh, response profiles uh, following these gaze shifts. So we went in and started off with a clustering approach. Uh, we clustered all the neurons into the shape of their uh, uh, PSTH. We classified some as early responses, some as late positive responses, some as biphasic, some as negative. We were kind of thinking of these as different groups of neurons until we plotted the means all together. And you can already start to see that there's this progression from the early to the late, to the biphasic, to the negative. And in fact, when we take uh, this clustering and sort our spike rasters accordingly, you can actually see that there ends up being this sequence. So each little triangle here shows one of those gaze shifting saccades. After each of those gaze shifts, you see this little ripple of activity that spreads across the population. It becomes evident once we do this uh, sorting. And in fact, if we look at the whole population of neurons, you can see that there's this temporal sequence from the early ones through to the biphasic, uh, down to the, uh, the negative responses. So what looked initially like, you know, different classes of neurons ends up being a temporal sequence that occurs each time the animal shifts its gaze. So the fact that this was happening when the animal is shifting its gaze and not when it's compensating suggested to us that it's something about this new visual input that's coming in uh, that's driving these responses. So to test this, we uh, uh, recorded from the same units in the light and then put the animal into the dark. So in the light here, again, you can see this temporal sequence. Once we put them in the dark, there's a small subset of neurons that still respond early on. We think these may be uh, neurons that are actually a true kind of motor corollary discharge. They're just responding to the saccade itself. But the rest of, uh, switch over to a kind of weak suppression, which you think is uh, consistent with saccade suppression. But then the bulk of this temporal sequence that we see here is being driven uh, by visual input. So if they're being driven by visual input, what are those neurons actually responding to? Uh, to test this, we went back and studied these neurons' properties under kind of the more traditional head fix conditions. So we would record freely moving, we find the temporal sequence, and then we recorded the responses of neurons to, grade, uh, to gradings of different spatial and temporal frequencies. So spatial frequency is basically how wide the spacing is in the gradings. And you can see that when we sorted the units according to their latency within this temporal sequence, the earlier ones responded to the low spatial frequency, so that's kind of very uh, coarse gradings, and then the later neurons responded to higher spatial frequency, in other words, to finer gradings. So there's this progression from coarse to fine that happens following each gaze shift, going from you know, basically extracting the coarse information about the scene to fine detail. 
And this is an idea that actually went back to Mahler's original idea of the primal sketch, that first you would extract kind of the coarse information in a scene and then fill in the details. Uh, people had seen some signatures of this, for example, in head fixed monkeys, but now we're able to show that during natural vision, anytime you shift to a new scene, or you know, shift, shift your gaze to a new point within the scene, you set off this sequence, of course, to find processing. Uh, you might think that this is just a mouse thing because they do have this relatively low acuity vision. Uh, but to check this, we actually teamed up uh, with Jake Gates and Jude Mitchell, uh, who were doing similar experiments in marmoset. Uh, these were head fixed marmosets, but they were free to gaze uh, within a natural scene. And they saw, when, you know, they had seen uh, these uh, post psychotic responses. And when they sorted them using the same criteria that we did, you can see that you get this same nice temporal sequence coming out. They also measured spatial and temporal frequency. And when you look at the spatial frequency as a function of the response latency, you get the same coarse defined processing. Uh, of course, the spatial frequency tuning of uh, marmosets is much higher, but we get the same coarse defined. Um, so this is pretty gratifying to see that, you know, even though mice and uh, monkeys have very different visual environments, they have a very different set of uh, eye movement. Uh, the, the repertoire of uh, eye movements is much broader. That if you go and you look at, you know, a simple, you know, kind of convert them into the same uh, modality of gaze shift versus non-gaze shift, that you get a similar processing sequence that occurs and a similar algorithm that can result from that. So it was nice to see, you know, this correspondence across species. Um, but this also really, to me, was kind of inspiring the way that we think about the visual input that's coming into an animal. So this is uh, showing the eye movement. Oops. This is that same spike raster, but now I'm showing the eye movements and this retinal corrected video. And you can see that each time that mouse makes an eye movement, you get this jump in the visual input and you get this course defined sequence across the population. So, you know, in vision, we typically show either, you know, like flashing a stimulus on the screen or sometimes we'll play a continuous movie to the animal. But they showed us that, you know, the real visual input that an animal gets is something that's neither, you know, somewhere in between those two. Each time you jump to a new location, new stimulus flashes on your eye, you get a brief clip of a movie, and then you jump to a new location, you get another short movie. So it kind of changes the way we think about the types of stimulus that the brain is actually processing when you move through the world. Okay, so to wrap up our studies of natural vision in the mouse, um, we've been developing ethological tasks like prey, prey capture or gap jumping. Uh, and these can provide insight into visual function. How is an animal using its vision to be able to solve different types of real world tasks? And then these freely moving recordings allow us to measure neural coding during these types of active vision, uh, mapping receptive fields and visual responses, and then being able to look at the dynamics across the population when you have a real pattern of visual input that comes in. All right, so in the last uh, couple of minutes here, I'll tell you about some of the work that we've been doing uh, studying visual processing in the octopus. Uh, so this is a project that was brought to the lab by a postdoc, uh, Judith Pungor, who basically, you know, she came to me with the challenge of, can we record visual responses in an octopus? And when I, you know, when she brought this to me, I, I kind of immediately became hooked. Um, the reason being that, you know, uh, octopuses, you know, cephalopods diverged from us, you know, over 700 million years ago. Our common ancestor was probably, you know, a tiny worm. Yet somehow through evolution, cephalopods also evolved a camera-like eye. It looks very much like ours. Uh, they have amazing visual capabilities. They can do all the normal things like prey capture and navigation. They can also do things like detecting the, a stimulus based purely on the polarization angle of light. Uh, and of course, they can camouflage based on the visual scene. So they have all these amazing visual capabilities but they do it with a brain that's completely different than ours. Um, I should know that you know, an adult octopus brain can be about the same size as a mouse's brain. So these are large brains, similar to vertebrates, but organized completely differently. Uh, rather than you know, forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain, there's just a series of lobes uh, interconnected with each other. But strikingly, you know, the largest of these uh, lobes is the optic lobes. They actually make up about two thirds of the octopus's brain. So in comparison to mouse V1, which is this tiny you know, two millimeter square that uh, we're all studying, this is the bulk of the, of the octopus's brain. And it's thought to be where most of the visual processing occurs. So for example, the output from here goes to premotor areas that do things like driving reaches or driving camouflage patterns. And kind of remarkably, nobody had ever performed a recording of visual responses within the optic lobe. So I, I like to compare this you know, to the vertebrates where you know, obviously there's still lots of things that we're learning about visual processing. But we know the rough outline. We know what the pathways are. We know roughly what receptive fields look like at different points along the pathways. Likewise, uh, for the Drosophila visual system. But in cephalopods, we know nothing about what goes on after the photoreceptor. 
We don't know what types of receptive fields there are. We don't know how these are organized within the optic lobe. And we don't know how these get sent to different brain areas uh, that are involved in the different types of behaviors that the octopus can do. Um, so it wasn't for lack of trying. Several people had tried doing electrophysiological recordings in, in cephalopods. It's really challenging for a number of reasons. They're invertebrates with tiny neurons. There's actually this connective tissue that goes through the brain and kind of like fascia uh, that essentially insulates the neurons. And of course they're in saline, so they're kind of in a shunt to ground. So when Judith came to the lab, we decided to use a calcium imaging approach. Uh, Judith also suggested we study juvenile octopus. Uh, this is uh, one of our uh, uh, subjects here. This is, the, I should mention, we were studying octopus by maculoides. Uh, they, are, they grow to be about this big as adults, about the size of a golf ball. Uh, we study them when they're about one to two months old. So their body is about the size of a pea. Their arms are on the order of five centimeters or so across. Uh, you can see this one engaged in prey capture behavior here. You can see kind of their amazing motor control. You know, like one arm's grabbing a brine shrimp on this side, another one's exploring its home over here. Um, one advantage of the juveniles is they're just much smaller, makes it the more easily accessible. As you mentioned, even though they're small, we can't image through the skin. It's not like a larval, not quite like a larval zebrafish yet. Um, so we do have to do some dissection to be able to get down to the brain. Uh, we also, um, unfortunately, don't have uh, the, all the typical genetic tools that you're used to in the mouse. We don't have G-camp octopuses yet. In fact, we don't even have any way to express G-camp in an octopus yet. So we had to go a little bit old school and do an injection of a synthetic calcium indicator dye. Uh, we're using Cal520. So we do some dissection to get down to the brain, immobilize the octopus, inject the calcium dye indicator, and we can get movies that look like this. Oops, sorry. I guess the corner up here is blanked out. Um, so this is the optic lobe. Uh, visual information comes into the superficial layers and then gets processed through a series of layers down into the medulla down here. And so you can see that when we're playing a visual stimulus, we can get activation of different populations of neurons across the optic lobe. I should mention there's a lot of challenges with actually doing somatic calcium imaging in the octopus and invertebrates in general, uh, largely because a lot of the neurons are unipolar. So a lot of the signals don't even make it up into the, the soma. So most of what we've been doing is analyzing the signals within the neuropill to look at the spatial organization of, of responses. Uh, but when we do this, we can get traces of activity that look like uh, much like what you might get out of a typical uh, calcium imaging approach with responses at different locations within the optic lobe, showing different uh, temporal response profiles. <laughs> Uh, so one of the first things we did was just presenting spots at different locations on, this, on, on the screen. And you can see that as we move this spot to corresponding locations across the screen, we get a corresponding movement of the activation pattern uh, across the optic lobe, suggesting that they're spatially selective uh, visual responses uh, and suggesting that these are retinotopically organized. So to map this out more carefully, we actually used a sparse noise stimulus, uh, did a spike triggered average to calculate the receptive fields of these uh, um, uh, multi-units within the neuropill, and we could get receptive fields out. So this is a response uh, to the on component of the stimulus. So this is one receptive field that, uh, for a unit that's responding to this location in space. And then this is an off response, a response to a dark stimulus uh, occurring at a neighboring location in space. So what we did is for all the units, we took you know, where within the visual field are they responding, and then mapped that onto their location within the optic lobe. And you can see that indeed we get a beautiful retinotopic map. So this is the map for the vertical location on the, on the screen, mapping onto the vertical location uh, on the optic lobe, and likewise for the horizontal. Uh, we get this for both light and dark stimuli. Uh, the maps are over, uh, overlapping with each other. Uh, one notable difference is that we don't get off responses, uh, responses to the dark in the superficial layers of the optic lobe. And that's because the photoreceptors in, uh, in vertebrates respond to light onset. So we think the input layers aren't responding to the off component and that happens in subsequent layers of the processing. So for us, this was you know, pretty exciting to see these retinotopic maps. Many visual species have retinotopic maps. There's some exceptions, things like reptiles actually don't have retinotopic maps in cortex. And in fact, there've been some questions in cephalopods. It turns out people would look for somatotopy, didn't find somatotopic maps. So there was this idea that maybe cephalopods don't use topographic organization at all. But sure enough, they do have uh, beautiful uh, retinotopic maps. So that's one thing that's shared with our visual system. Uh, we found some differences when we started to look at the responses to light versus dark stimuli, and particularly to light and dark stimuli of different sizes. So when we looked at spots, light spots of different sizes, as we made the spots larger and larger, we saw a decreased response. This is consistent with lateral inhibition or surround suppression, typical phenomenon in the visual system. On the other hand, when we looked at dark spots, you can see that if anything, there was a slightly increasing response as we made the spots larger and larger. 
So this means on the whole, the octopus visual system, at least at these early layers, is going to be biased towards processing small light spots or large dark spots. Um, this is actually, you know, in the vertebrate visual system, there's a slight bias, but it's actually in the opposite direction. Uh, we were kind of curious why this might be, and it was actually Jose Manuel Alonso, who studies on and off processing uh, in uh, mammals, in uh, cats and primates, who suggested that maybe this has something to do with the underwater scene. So water filters light, as that means things that are far away, like landmarks, might appear dark, and the small things that are close up that you might be grabbing as food are going to appear light on that dark background. So here we've now found a difference with the vertebrate visual system that might potentially be matched uh, to the, uh, the different uh, visual environment that octopuses live in. So that's some of our work looking at uh, the functional properties of the octopus visual system. But as we were doing this, we realized, you know, if we really want to start figuring out how the octopus visual system works in the same way that we do in, you know, mouse and Drosophila, we're going to need to know something about the cell types. And we did have some idea about cell types, uh, going back to J.Z. Young, who did kind of the equivalent of Cajal uh, for the octopus optic lobe. You know, he did Golgi stains, drew the anatomy of a whole range of uh, different cell types that kind of gave us a guess at to what the circuit might be. But we had no information about, you know, functionally, what are these different cell types? We didn't even know what neurotransmitters they're using, let alone things like transcription factors that might allow us to access them genetically. Uh, so to address this, uh, I teamed up uh, with uh, two colleagues at UO, Adam Miller and Andy Kern as well as an awesome team of uh, uh, grad student, staff scientists, grad student and postdoc, who implemented a single cell sequencing approach and created an atlas of the octopus visual system based on that. Uh, so we used uh, single, started off with single cell sequencing that allowed us to define the different cell types based on the transcriptional profile. And then we could take each of these individual cell types, find a candidate marker, and then go into the octopus brain to see where it's localized. Uh, so this is a little bit about the cell types that we found. Overall, we could divide them up into uh, six main ca uh, classes based on their neurotransmitter expression. So for example, this is a, uh, uh, a group up here that uses both uh, dopamine and glutamate uh, based on the transporters and uh, synthetic pathways. This is a purely dopaminergic group. This is a group that expresses a neuropeptide orchokinin, glutamate, uh, acetylcholine, and so on. And you can see that these largely make up disjoint uh, uh, populations uh, within the, the uh, population of neurons. So we're able to define these broad classes based on the neurotransmitters. If we then go in and look at where these are within the optic lobe, we can see that they correspondingly occupy different locations within that circuitry, with the dopaminergic neurons being primarily this input layer of amacrine cells, uh, progressing to the cholinergic and, uh, sorry, the dopaminergic and cholinergic cells as we go deeper into the optic lobe. Uh, these are just kind of the, the broad organization. If we actually then zoom in, you're taking within each of those large classes, finding individual clusters marked by specific genes, we actually found a pretty amazing degree of uh, organization within this large scale structure. So for example, this is the dopaminergic population that's in that output uh, input layer. And we were able to see this really nice sublamination once we looked at individual markers. Some of these markers were actually kind of interesting. One of these is 6345, which is a transcription factor. It's known to be involved in cell fate specification. Uh, these are neuropeptides. This is DSCAM, an adhesion molecule that have been shown to be involved in laminar formation uh, in uh, Drosophila and chick. So we're able to not only find some nice you know, sub-layer uh, organization, but also molecules that might be involved in setting up this type of organization. Uh, so putting this together, uh, the team uh, built, first of all, the, um, uh, the kind of cell type uh, 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 sorry, the taxonomy of cell types based on the transcriptional profile, where we have about 34 different clusters that we can now define. And then they were able to go and put these into an atlas where we can figure out where each of these are within the optic lobe circuitry. Uh, as an example of, you know, the way I think this can be useful in trying to figure out how the octopus visual system works is this one little cluster out here, uh, which expresses tyramine beta hydroxylase. Uh, that's the synthetic pathway for octopamine, which is thought of as the invertebrate equivalent of nor uh, noradrenaline. And it also expresses this one specific protocadherin. And we look at where these are within the optic lobe, you can see that they're this one little ring of cells out in the input layer uh, of the optic lobe. And so this is cool, you know, we found this very specific cell type. It's marked by one specific protocadherin that might be involved in setting up its connectivity. Uh, but for me personally, what was exciting is that, you know, in uh, uh, Drosophila, people have shown similar effects of locomotion, uh, the Dickinson lab and others. And it's shown that this was mediated by octopamine. And so now we're seeing this little population of neurons expressing octopamine out in the input layer of the octopus uh, visual system, suggesting that this might be a place, a locus that could be mediating behavioral state effects in the octopus uh, visual system as well. 
So that's kind of our approach to studying the octopus vision, a visual system. Uh, on the one hand, uh, trying to you know recapitulate all the visual physiology in the octopus, you know, studying different visual stimuli, what drives neurons, uh, moving on to natural scenes, as well as things like polarization, and then being able to figure out the circuitry and how all this links up to be able to drive the different types of behavior uh, that the octopus uses its vision for. Uh, so with that, I want to thank uh, everybody uh, who contributed to this work. I tried to acknowledge everybody along the way, uh, but they're also highlighted here. Uh, the whole lab, uh, our funding sources, and happy to take any questions. Questions? Um, any trainees want to ask a question to get things started? Not, I see a couple of hands. Somebody out there? No? All right, you're the closest. Hey, thank you. Great talk. Um, I was just noting the lack of GABAergic cells yeah. in the octopus. Could you could you comment on that a little bit? Yep, that kind of freaked me out when we saw it as well. But it turns out that that had actually been known since about the 80s, that there's no uh, GABA in the optic lobe. Um, people think that it, especially, well, hypothesize in uh, the octopus, but also in other invertebrates that acetylcholine is often inhibitory. And so in the uh, bulk of the optic lobe, we basically see glutamatergic and cholinergic cells. And so we think that might be the excitatory inhibitory population. But yeah, we were very worried about that in our single cell data, but then it ends up being true in in situs and then in the literature from the eighties. So, yep. Yeah, lots of weird things. You know, you kind of have to throw a lot of the, you know your assumptions out the window. You know, part of part of it for, was for us moving to invertebrates at all, where things can be different. But also, just in you know the octopus, we had you know basically no idea what to be expecting there. So, yeah. Hey, Chris. Thanks. That was really beautiful. Um, you started out your talk talking about the similarity in receptive field shapes between rodent yeah. and primate, and sort of hypothesized that there may be some things in common. And then you talked about the rodent, you kind of um, say ethologically relevant yeah. behaviors and tried to connect it. And then we have some beautiful comparative you know, sort of anatomy here with the octopus. But I wonder if you could like walk all the way back to that primate yeah. comment. These are the things that we know that are different um, you know, in the circuitry. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think a lot about like the E to I cell type ratios and they're yeah. very different in primate to rodent. So there's something going on that's different in the computation there. Any conjectures about you know, behavioral differences and computational differences that might be going on despite the similar receptive field shapes between primates and rodents? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I should say, you know, particularly back then, we were very excited about all the things that were in common. Um, and now, of course, people learn lots of things that are different. You know, one actually striking thing, Alex Huck, uh, for years, people have said, you know, is it, it is that running effect uh, there in primates as well? And we kept waiting for somebody to do the experiment and Alex Huck has done it now. So he has marmosets on a running wheel, kind of similar to our ball, but he has a bicycle wheel they run on. And the effect of locomotion is much smaller and it's actually in the opposite direction, um, at least. So in the fovea, it seems to be in the opposite direction. They had one or two experiments already recorded in the periphery and it seemed to be in the same direction, a positive gain. And so that does suggest that there's gonna be differences in your ecological niche. So, you know, we do, we spend a lot of our time, you know, doing visual behaviors when we're head fixed, sitting still, you know, staring at a computer monitor. We, we do all that. And so primates may not have as strong a locomotion effect because, you know, they spend a lot of their time uh, doing stationary vision. And in fact, there's a lot of uh, evidence or there's anatomical evidence suggesting that, you know, the acetylcholine pathway that we had shown, you know, or us together with the Stryker lab had shown uh, mediates effect in V1. Um, basically in primates skips over V1 and really only becomes prominent when you get up to V4. So there's almost certainly differences based on like your ecological niche, what the you know, visual scene is, what are you using the vision for, what you're using vision for, and especially a lot of these behavioral state things, you know, the types of states that we go through versus the states that a mouse goes through, you know, they're basically, you know, sitting still or moving. They don't kind of have that in-between state uh, are almost certainly going to be different. So. so that was one example of how there definitely are differences, but I think, um, and that was part of the reason why we were kind of surprised, you know, the, the, the gay shift response was so similar between mouse and primate. Cause I thought, you know, if there's anything that's different between us and primates, it's how we move our eyes. Um, but it turns out, you know, once you think about a gaze shift, no matter how that gaze shift occurred, you get similar processing that comes out of it. Yeah. Really fun talk. Um, 
I noticed in the in the example that you were just talking about with the marmoset and the mouse stuff, there was a really nice example of sort of temporal or at least latency coding across yeah. the population. But the absolute spike rate changes were on like on the order of one to five spikes per second, at least in the data that I saw. So yeah. I'm curious if there might be a role for precise spike timing coding or phase coding or something that's a little bit more subtle than this sort of uh, spike rate population coding. I know that's the like where we would all start. Yeah. But have, have you guys explored that at all in that population recording? That's really nice. We haven't per se. One of the things actually that Elliot's been working on is uh, trying to decode the stimulus at different times following a saccade. So our idea is that you know it's the visual input coming in and then different neurons responding to that at different different time points. And so based on that, we would expect that, you know, these early cell, early responding cells would be the ones that are contributing to decoding early and the later responding ones would be contributing late. And particularly might be better at decoding, you know, the fine detail of a scene or a high pass version of the scene versus a low pass version of the scene uh, early. And he's still working on that, so we don't have an answer. But that's kind of the way that we're thinking about it. I think what you're asking, like, it, does the precise time of the spike uh, matter? And I can definitely see a role for that um, in that, a downstream area would be, you know, tending to read out one population versus another, depending on what it's looking for. Um, but I also kind of think about it as more of a sequence in terms of what's being represented at different times, as opposed to the timing of the spike itself. So I think, yeah. Like Yeah. So I, I, one thing I should mention is that this all cross validates. So if you sort on one population, you get it. Or if you set, sort, sort on half the data, you get it in the other half the data. So it's not at least an artifact in, in that respect. Um, but I think the question, you know, maybe this doesn't quite the answer, but it, one could also say this is, you know, just representing latent, you know, different, the different neurons have different latencies. And if you have a set of different latencies, then they're going to form a sequence. And that's almost obviously true. Um, and it does actually, in fact, match with the visual system. We know that magno cells tend to respond quickly to changes. And I, I didn't show this data, but it turns out the early ones have high temporal frequency tuning. So they're going to respond to the transient and the other ones are going to respond later. But what comes out of this when you put it all together is the combination of that temporal frequency with your spatial frequency response means different information is coming through at different points along there. So, but it does raise the question of like, how do you read this out? And I, uh, Especially because, as you're pointing out, you're, you're only really going to get, you know, in the mean, we get a five spike per second risk, you know, change, change of firing on any given gaze shift that's, you know, zero or one. And we think a lot of that is basically just driven on dependent. And that's where the kind of decoding comes in is you'll fire a spike if you move your eyes and you landed on an optimal stimulus. You aren't going to fire a spike if you move your eyes and you land on a suboptimal stimulus. Thank you, Sam. Hi, thank you. Um, I was really interested in how uh, in the freely moving mice, there's a gain in the response when uh, the mice is, starts its movement. So I was wondering, I might have missed the detail, but is, are the mice involved in some sort of searching task or if there would be a change if uh, in the gain if it was looking for something? Yeah, that's a great question. No, they're just, well, they're, they're freely moving. Uh, we occasionally do it, you know, we learned this trick from the play cell people. You put a few little pieces of food around the arena to give them some motivation to keep moving. Uh, we haven't gone back to look and see if there's any signals associated, particularly with like when they find one of the uh, the tortilla chips or not. Um, it's really just to kind of keep them moving so they don't, you know, it turns out one of the tricks to being able to estimate the receptive fields is if the animal is sitting still for a long period of time, you have a huge over-representation of that stimulus in your data set and um, those biases throw things off. So we keep them moving we throw out the times when they're, uh, when they're completely still. Uh, most of what I mentioned about the gain effect was actually from the head fix mouse. We did have some data where we, uh, uh, after we had mapped the receptive fields, we looked to see what other signals might modulate that. And Elliot found that there's several uh, things that seem to provide a multiplicative gain. Uh, one of which is actually just head position and eye position. So it ends up looking like a gain field like people have seen in you know, primate parietal cortex. Um, and also locomotion does still provide a gain effect when the animal's freely moving. But we haven't done this. Well, we've, we've been doing some experiments in prey capture, but that's still, we don't have enough data to analyze for that yet. Um, but at least um, running does still modulate the firing when the animal is freely moving, but we haven't associated with that any, with, that, with any particular phase of the task. Uh, 
it's at 1220 now, so I'm going to uh, let people go. Uh, but if anybody has any quick questions they want to come up and talk to Chris about, now's the time. And let's just thank Chris again before we go.